What is up, everybody? Happy Thursday. Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Let me just tell you, I missed you. I was very much looking forward to doing an episode yesterday, and then things happened. Life happened. Uh, weather hit, power went out for 18 hours, and that's why things were a little bit delayed. That's why you got a Ross Uglum primary episode yesterday, and super thankful for for Ross for having episodes uh, available that I could get something up. And then, uh, of course, Dusty, Steve, and Sarah on the audio side of things as well. So my apologies yesterday for the delay on things, and certainly wish that I would have been able to do an episode as well, but sometimes things happen. We still have not missed a single day since we started doing this. So uh, we still have the streak going, but I am very happy to be back today. Really quick shout out to our new member, Southern Cheese, on the YouTube channel. Appreciate you signing up, Southern Cheese. And I do have, really quick, if you'll bear with me, three big announcements that I want to go over very, very quickly. The first one is that there is going to be a ton of live draft coverage right here on the Packaday podcast on the YouTube channel. Thursday night for the draft, I will be doing a full live show uh, hosted by yours truly, where I will be breaking down every single pick. We'll be doing a live Q&A. We'll be doing everything. And that will go from the beginning of the draft till the end of the draft. We're going to go through the entirety of it. Not going to miss anything. So make sure that you're checking out the Pack-A-Day podcast, day one of the NFL draft. Day two of the NFL draft, you will also have me live uh, right here on the Pack a Day podcast YouTube channel, but I'll also have some special guests along the way that I'm super excited about. I want to announce one of those right now. One of those is going to be Maggie Loney, my good friend, who is going to be joining me. She's going to be co hosting with me. We're going to have some other special guests. So, super excited about that and looking forward to that. And if you're not already following Maggie, make sure to do that. But that will be day two, night two of the draft on Friday. And then day three of the draft, I'm going to do something, don't exactly know what yet, but that will be for members only, probably do a shorter piece of uh, day three of the draft. And like I said, that will be for members only. So make sure to check out those Pack-A-Day podcast YouTube memberships. In addition, announcement number two, that Friday, night two of the draft, I will be doing a live Q&A probably from uh, about four to 5.30, a happy hour at Badger State Brewery. Uh, I'm going to be doing that from about 4 to 5.30 and then making my way home to do the live show on YouTube. Then, if you'd rather do a live version, uh, Ross Uglum is going to be taking over for me at 5.30 at Badger State Brewery, and he's going to go from 5.30 through the rest of the evening. And we may have some other special guests there as well, uh, but you will have me for the first hour and a half as a happy hour, and then Ross will take you the rest of the way home. So if you'd rather go and enjoy some amazing amazing Badger State beer and uh, be in person, I will be there followed by Ross Uglum. So that will be night two of the draft that Friday. Before the draft, through the draft, we have you covered there as well. And then last but not least, as I've been telling you guys, April 19th, Wisconsin Timber Rattlers game, $10 a ticket gets you into the game. Also gets you a live NFL draft Q and a with me. Uh, I'll be doing a Q and a prior to the game that will end a half an hour before first pitch. Apparently I'm also going to be throwing out the first pitch for the game. So that will be, you know, appointment viewing as well. And you'll want to get that on video so that you can po- uh, post it with memes and everything else. So hopefully I don't pull a full Stephen A. Smith uh, on that throw, but should be a really fun night, so make sure to check that out as well. Again, $10 a ticket gets you the Q&A in the game, uh, obviously for Timber Rattlers and, and everything else. And uh, the Timber Rattlers do such a phenomenal job uh, with their game day experience. I think voted number one park recently as well. So make sure to check that out. All amazing draft stuff coming up. Q&A on April 19th at the Timber Rattler Stadium, live draft coverage on the YouTube channel Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then of course the live Badger State show on Friday as well with myself and Ross Uglum. So make sure to check all of that out. All right, really quickly, before we get into some draft conversation, which should be really, really fun, going to be going over a variety of different topics. Just a few pieces of news and notes from the past couple days. Uh, Packers lose their salary cap guru, their salary cap expert, not Russ Ball, thankfully, but they're next in line. That was Joey Lane. He is a salary cap analyst for Green Bay. He is now a vice president of football administration for the Seattle Seahawks. So he gets a promotion and is heading to Seattle. Shouldn't affect Green Bay too much. Russ Ball still oversees the entire side of that thing. But Green Bay, as you know, always likes to have like their next in line. And that easily could have been Joey Lane in Green Bay. It is no longer Joey Lane in Green Bay. He is headed to Seattle. Meanwhile, from a football side of things, Patrick Taylor is now a member of the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, He signs a deal with them. Not an unexpected move that Patrick Taylor is gone. You have to imagine that with getting 
Josh Jacobs in with bringing A.J. Dillon back and with having Emmanuel Wilson on the roster, plus likely to draft a running back or two uh, come dra- you know draft time. Very unlikely that Taylor was going to be back. Taylor will have to fight tooth and nail just to make that 49ers roster, which always has good running backs, but he'll get the opportunity there, which also means that Rudy Ford is the only remaining available Packers free agent. We'll see if Green Bay brings him back. That would be one where if Green Bay gets through the draft and the safety class does not go according to plan, meaning they don't get the safeties that they want, and maybe they end up only with a late day three pick there or something, then I think you could see Rudy Ford sign back with Green Bay, but I don't expect anything to happen there prior to the draft, and it's possible Rudy Ford could get picked up elsewhere. I've seen a lot of people be like, why isn't Green Bay bringing back Rudy Ford? Listen, if if Rudy Ford had that value, uh, he'd be picked up by somebody by now. He's the only Packers free agent that, in fact, has not been picked up. And remember, too, at the end of last year, he was behind just about everyone. He was behind Anthony Johnson Jr. Uh, he was uh, behind Darnell Savage. You know, he got he was he was all the way down on the depth chart at that point. He was behind Jonathan Owens. He was basically number four by the end of the season. If Green Bay felt differently, he would have been higher. If Green Bay felt differently, he would have been back by now. And if the NFL felt dif- differently, he would have been on a team by now. So not super surprising. But like I said, if you get through the draft, safety doesn't go your way. Maybe then they could look at bringing Rudy Ford back on the roster at that point. All right, that brings us to our main topic for today. And I'm sort of labeling it what to expect when you're expecting to pick at pick 25. And what I wanted to do is take a a bit of a deep dive into pick 25 in the draft and the surrounding area around pick 25 to see what happens. Are good things happening around pick 25 or bad things happening? Are there Hall of Famers and all pros being selected? Is it a bunch of junk? Is it uh, one specific position that's having a lot of success? Are there a lot of trades around that pick? So let's take a look. On its easiest and simplest terms, here are the 25 players that were picked over the last 25 years at pick 25. Love synergy there. All right, so the 25 players. Last year, Dalton Kincaid, the tight end for the Bills, had a really nice first season for Buffalo. A year before that, Tyler Linderbaum, the center for the Baltimore Ravens out of the University of Iowa, that turned out really well. He's already got a Pro Bowl under his belt. Before that, Travis Etienne, good running back, probably hasn't quite turned out the way that they maybe wanted it to, but he's a very nice running back for Jacksonville. The year before that, Brandon Ayuk with the San Francisco 49ers. That's a home run selection. Hollywood Brown, the year before that. Hayden Hurst, the tight end, up and down for him. Jabril Peppers, the safety, same thing. He goes from Cleveland to New England, has sort of resurrected his career a little bit in, uh, I think there was a giant stop in there as well, if I remember correctly, but has done a really nice job in New England, has always been a good starter. Don't think maybe the the Browns got the ROI they were hoping at that point, but good player. Artie Burns was a longtime player, never really hit his his ceiling, never really hit his stride, but played for a significant amount of snaps in the NFL. Shaq Thompson, the linebacker for the Panthers before that, really nice career. Jason Verrett, who was on to incredible things before having injury after injury after injury after injury. Just a really tough career for him based on the injuries, but he was going to go on to be one of the really great corners in the league had it not been for all of that. Xavier Rhodes, the year before that, who had a really great career in Minnesota. Dante Hightower, the two-time Pro Bowl linebacker for the New England Patriots. James Carpenter, longtime offensive lineman for the Seattle Seahawks. Timmy Tebow was right before that. Uh, Avante Davis, who was unfortunately in the news this week, uh, passed away, Uh, but he was a two-time Pro Bowl corner. He was the year before that. Mike Jenkins, a one-time Pro Bowl corner the year before that. John Beeson, three-time Pro Bowl linebacker and one-time All-Pro the year before that. Santonio Holmes, the year before that. Jason Campbell, the quarterback, who unfortunately is also no longer with us, uh, but he was the year before that. Then Ahmed Carroll, not great. Uh, William Joseph, the year before that, had a nice career. Charles Grant as an edge rusher. Freddie Mitchell, we hate to bring up fourth and 26. Fred X, but you know, uh, the originator, I think, of the belt that Aaron Rodgers would eventually adopt after that. Uh, Chris Hovan, the Minnesota Viking defensive tackle, who was a pain in Green Bay side for a handful of seasons there. And then Antoine Edwards, the corner slash safety for Green Bay. That is the last 25 years of pick 25. Uh, Green Bay, not a ton of luck, specifically taking defensive backs, taking Antoine Edwards and Ahmed Carroll. That did not exactly go according to plan. As of late, some pretty good selections, though. I think the interesting thing here of those 25 players who you feel, you know, you, you remember play multiple seasons, you only have 13 Pro Bowls combined and only two All Pros combined of those 25 players. Now, Tyler Linderbaum, uh, you know, uh, Brandon Ayuk, Dalton Kincaid, some of these guys could still have 
Pro Bowl and all pro years ahead of them. They were just recently selected. Uh, Linderbaum already has a, uh, a one-time Pro Bowl selection on his resume. So you could get some more of those, but 25 players over all the seasons that they've played, only 13 Pro Bowlers amongst all of them. And again, only two all pros. So a lot of what I would consider good to even really good players on this list a lot of lacking in the great to Hall of Fame slash multiple time all pro sort of category at pick 25. Now, the Pro Bowls, Tyler Linderbaum was a one time Pro Bowler, Jason Verrett, one time Pro Bowler, Xavier Rhodes, three time Pro Bowler and one time all pro, Dante Hightower, two time Pro Bowler, Vontae Davis, two time Pro Bowler, Mike Jenkins, one time, and John, ba- John Beeson, excuse me, three times. Those are the only Pro Bowlers from that list. And again, the All Pro. Uh, John Beeson one time and Xavier Rhodes one time as first team all pro. That was it. So it has been lacking in premium players, meaning big time all pro hall of fame type players, but a lot of really good players on that list. And that brought me to what I kind of wanted to look at next. Let's look at the last 10 years and let's not just look at pick 25 because pick 25 is very narrow. Uh, A team may have a specific need at that point that they're selecting. You're going to get all different teams selecting. So let's take a look at picks 23 through 27, that range of players. And let's take a look at it from a more recent point of view just over the last decade. So picks 23 to 27, five players in every draft for the last 10 years. So 50 players total right in that pick 25 range. Here is how it broke down position by position. There are only two quarterbacks taken in that 23 to 27 range. One of them you might know relatively well. That, of course, is Jordan Love. The other, Paxton Lynch. One has gone very, very well. One went very, very poorly. Running back, Najee Harris for Pittsburgh. Travis Etienne, who we talked about. Josh Jacobs, Green Bay's current running back. And then Rashad Penny, who did not work out very, very well at all. Uh, he's been fine. I think he's, he was on Philly last year. I don't know if he's still there or not. But uh, four running backs total taken in that range. Wide receiver, there have been eight wide receivers taken in that range, and it has worked out pretty darn well. Jordan Addison, Rashad Bateman, who's been okay, but Brandon Ayuk, Hollywood Brown, DJ Moore, Calvin Ridley, and then you had two that didn't work out as great in Laquan Treadwell and Brashad Perryman, but Jordan Addison, Brandon Ayuk, Hollywood Brown, DJ Moore, and Kelvin Ridley is a pretty good group of wide receivers, and Rashad Bateman still, uh, I think, is a good. We'll see if he can develop anything past that. And then Treadwell and Perryman, not quite as good at their specific uh, positions. All right, tight end. Only three tight ends taken around this spot. Dalton Kincaid, who we talked about. Hayden Hurst, who we talked about. And then Evan Ingram. Offensive tackle. Been some pretty good offensive tackles. Now, Anton Harrison got taken last year. He was an immediate starter. Was okay at best. Tyler Smith, the year before that, who was taken as a tackle, but has played guard so far in Dallas. Looks like he might kick out to left tackle this season for them. Christian Derrissaw, who's been phenomenal for Minnesota. Titus Howard, of course, who's been fantastic for Houston. Isaiah Wins had a really nice career and is still starting in the league. And then DJ Humphreys, who has done a really nice job as well uh, with Arizona as of late. Tyler Linderbaum at interior offensive line and Cesar Ruiz on the interior of the offensive line. So only two interior offensive linemen taken around that spot. Only two defensive linemen, Mozzie Smith for Dallas this past year, and then another familiar name, Kenny Clark for your Green Bay Packers as well, but only two defensive tackles taken in that range. Edge rushers, Jermaine Johnson for the Jets, Montez Sweat, who is now, of course, a member of the Chicago Bears, Tack McKinley did not work out at all. Shane Ray did not work out at all. D Ford had a pretty nice career before some injuries derailed it, and then Marcus Smith was a total bust before that. Off-ball linebacker, only four off-ball linebackers. Devin Lloyd, Kenneth Murray, Jordan Brooks, and Shaq Thompson. Shaq Thompson worked out very well. Devin Lloyd had a really nice year a season ago. He seems to be trending up. Kenneth Murray, Jordan Brooks didn't really live up to expectations. At corner, you had 10 total corners, so a very popular position in this range. Deontay Banks a season ago for the Giants, Kyer Elam for the Bills, Greg Newsom for the Cleveland Browns, uh, Gary and Conley, which did not work out at all for the Raiders. Tredavious White, which worked out very, very well for the Bills. William Jackson, Artie Burns, we talked about. Byron Jones worked out great. Darquez Denard had a nice career. And then Jason Verrett, who we talked about as well. So some really good corners in that range as well. And then safety. If you're hoping Green Bay is going to take a safety, maybe you know, pump the brakes a little bit. Only three, and they have not worked out well. Jonathan Abram, another former Packer for what, like a handful of weeks maybe at most. Uh, he did not work out at all. Jabril Peppers, we talked about, and then Dion Buchanan did not work out. They tried moving him to linebacker, and that did not work out as well. So in total, 
You had two quarterbacks, four running backs, eight wide receivers, three tight ends, six offensive tackles, two interior offensive linemen, two defensive linemen, six edge rushers, four linebackers, 10 corners, and three safeties. The popular positions around that time, corner at 10 and wide receiver with eight. As far as like what turned out best, we talked about wide receiver. You've got some pretty good players in there, especially as of late. Addison Bateman, Ayuk, Hollywood Brown, DJ Moore, and Kelvin Ridley were the last six taken. That is a pretty good selection. Um, Also offensive tackle, right? I think if you look at that position, again, Anton Harrison was a first-year starter a season ago. Tyler Smith has been a starter since day one with Chicago, although he did move inside to guard. Christian Derrissaw has been fantastic at left tackle for Minnesota. Titus Howard at uh, Houston, I, as we mentioned, Isaiah Wynn has been a long-term starter, and so has DJ Humphreys. No real like all-pro type players, although we'll see what Derrissaw uh, can kind of turn into. We'll see if Tyler Smith's career and, and, and where Anton Harrison's career goes, but just really good players, really good starters, and that's been like the safest pick. And when we talked about the other day, of uh, like what is the most likely Packers selection around that point in the draft. If we look at what they look at premium position, which is usually offensive tackle is a piece of that, a relative athletic score over eight, a big time college, uh, usually a power five conference, you know, all the things. And then like their usual thresholds. If we look at everything um, and then, sorry, 22 years of age or younger, uh, 22 years of age or younger, those are usually the things that Green Bay looks at the list of players that that like basically had on it was Terry and Arnold, that corner who's probably gone and then seven offensive linemen. So you look at like their trends as to what they normally take. It's all offensive linemen based. And then you look at like what players have turned out in that 23 to 27 range. You kind of don't mind the offensive linemen that have been selected. They've been pretty darn good players. We know Green Bay's probably not going wide receiver at that spot, which has also turned out pretty well. Corner's been up and down. Safety's been bad. Linebacker's been hit and miss. Edge has been hit and miss. Quarter and defensive tackle, quarterback, excuse me, and defensive tackle. When Green Bay selects him, Jordan Love and Kenny Clark, good. When anyone else, Paxton Lynch and Mozzie Smith, not so great. So yeah, I mean, you sort of look at it and offensive line, at least historically, has been a pretty safe pick right around that spot. Uh, let's look at then at trades, because this is another interesting way of looking at it. Has 25 been a spot of action? Have there been many deals that have been done at pick 25? The answer is a resounding yes. The last seven consecutive drafts, the team who originally owned pick 25 has not picked at pick 25. In fact, there have been that pick has been traded eight times in seven years. That's a lot of trades for one pick. And again, in the last seven years, it's never been selected by the team who, excuse me, who originally had it. In the last 20 years, it has been traded 14 out of 20 times. And in fact, again, it has been traded 15 times in the last 19 years, which is really incredible. So in 2023, it moved up to 24, and then the team that moved down to 25 moved down again to pick 27. So it was traded twice this past season, up to 24 and down to 27. It was moved up to pick 23 in 2022. It was used via the Jalen Ramsey trade in 2021. It moved down to pick 31 in 2020, up to pick 22 in both 2019 and 2018. It moved all the way up to pick 12 in 2017. Then you had a three-year stretch in 2014, 15, and 16 where it was not traded at all. In 2013, it was part of a Percy Harvin trade. In 2012, traded down to pick 31. 2011, it was not traded. 2010, it went all the way down to pick 43. 2009, it was not traded. 2008, it was traded down to pick 28. uh, 2007, it was traded up all the way to pick 14. 2006, traded down to pick 32. 2005, it was traded all the way down to pick 76 with a team picking up a future first round pick plus other stuff in that trade. And then in 2004, it was not traded at all. So a lot of movement at pick 25. Again, seven consecutive drafts where that pick has been moved, 14 of the last 20. It's been traded 15 times in the last 19 years. And it has gone as high as pick 12 and as low as pick 76, which again involved a future first round pick. So if you're hoping that Green Bay is going to move up in the top 10 of the draft or above pick 12, that has been few and far between. When the team did go up to pick 12, they had to use a future first round pick to get up from pick uh, 25 to pick 12. 
when they moved all the way down to pick 76, they picked up a future first round pick and some other stuff going all the way down to pick 76. So if you're hoping for an aggressive trade up, don't look much past pick 12. That it, There's just not been a history of it. And if you're looking for a big trade down, don't look for anything lower than pick 76. So I can pretty much tell you Green Bay will be utilizing that pick to pick somewhere between pick 12 and pick 76. And likely, based on history, not at pick 25. So that is what history tells us about that pick. That's all I have to to really talk about from a historical standpoint. Uh, but I do have a couple other questions that I do want to go over that I've been asked recently in some Q and A's and I thought would be just good conversation for today's episode. Um, so let's jump into it right away. The first question I've been asked is, should Green Bay use all 11 of those draft picks? And the answer to that in a variety of different ways that I could go with this is, I don't really care. And, and what I mean by that is, don't look at it as should they use all 11 picks or should they not use all 11 picks? How you should look at it is you make every decision individually. And what I mean by that is when you get to pick 25 or maybe when you even get to pick 18, and we talked about this on a couple different occasions, but you get to pick 18 and you look up at your draft board and you've only got two guys left that you have first round grades on. You want to start making phone calls where if one of those guys goes, you can hopefully move up to get the last remaining guy that has a first round grade on your board. Now it's possible you get to pick 24 and those two guys are still on there and you feel great. And you know, even if the guy gets taken, one of the guys gets taken at pick 24, you're still going to get one of your first round picks at pick 25. And maybe both of them will be there and you get to choose the better of the two, but that's your first look at it. And if you get only one guy left around pick 20, yeah, you're going to start trying to utilize some of those 11 draft picks to get up to get the remaining first round pick on your board. In which case, that's exactly what they should be doing. Don't sit on your 11 picks for the sake of having 11 picks. Do what's best for you and make sure that you get one of the guys that is a first round grade on your draft board. Vice versa. It could be that Green Bay has 17 first round grades on their board and they go in the first 17 picks and Green Bay didn't have the ability to move up to get one of them or the price was just too steep. And then you get to pick 25 and you look at your board and there are 10 guys that you have with like that late round one, early round two grade. So, you know, you can go back to pick 32, 33, 34 relatively easily and know that you're still going to get a guy that has a very similar grade to what you would have if you picked a player right now. And if that's the case and you can pick up an extra second or third round pick by moving down those eight to 10 spots while still getting a player that is the exact same grade on your draft board, then that is the smart way to go. And even if that means I have now 12 picks or 13 picks, that's fine. And what I would also say here is you can fill this roster with 11, 12 draft picks. You can certainly take a quarterback that could be a developmental third quarterback or maybe even somebody that just competes with Sean Clifford. You can certainly take, there, there's two running back spots available, maybe even more than that, but there's at least two running back spots available. Emmanuel Wilson and AJ Dillon are not guaranteed roster spots on this team right now. There's two running back spots. I think there's tight end spots. Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave are the only ones that are guaranteed. Is Ben Sims likely? Yes. But is like, are you not taking a tight end that you like in the draft because Ben Sims is on the roster? No way. Like you will gladly take that player and let them compete with Ben Sims and you can still keep four tight ends. You're competing then at number four with Tyler Davis. There's no guarantee Tyler Davis makes the team. Offensive line, like they legitimately could keep five offensive linemen. Luke Tenuta, Caleb Jones, Royce Newman, they're no locks to make the roster. Your five right now starters are, but you could keep 10 offensive linemen and there's five spots available. There's five more players you could add to the roster. Defensive linemen, you could keep uh, an extra defensive lineman there. And I mean, on the interior of the defensive line, that's within the realm of possibility. You've only got five guys right now that are locks to make the team at edge rusher. You could easily have somebody come in and compete with Brenton Cox, or you could just keep five as Kingsley Nigbari goes probably on the, you know, um, pup list to start the season corner. You've got five guys right now, but you know, you look at a guy like Corey Ballantyne, even sneakily Eric Stokes, like not 100% lead pipe locks to make the team. You could have two, three positions there that are available in safety. Like I wouldn't even put Anthony Johnson Jr. as a lock. Like the only one that's a lock right now is Xavier McKinney. Everyone else is uh, a, like is going to have to compete for their job. Kicker has to compete for their job. 
I think Daniel Whalen probably makes it, but if you wanted to draft a punter, you could probably have them compete there. But th- my point being is there's probably 15, 20 spots that are, if not competitive, like open for business. So yeah, you absolutely can use 11, 12, 13 picks and have them still make the roster and not cut anyone of any significance. Now, we can look at certain positions. If you take two wide receivers, you're, yeah, you're going to have to probably end up cutting somebody that you really like or trading somebody that you like. It's not the worst thing in the world, but you know you probably want to limit how many wide receivers you take. The other thing I'll say too is this is a team that can always still utilize young talent. They want competition in every single room. And that's exactly the way that Goody's going to look at this. And injuries are going to play a part in this too. As Goody said, and in, in quoting Ted Thompson, this or what two weeks ago or at the at the NFL, um, you know, league meetings, so you don't know what your needs are going to be six months from now. So you could go into it right now feeling great about wide receiver, and all of a sudden Christian Watson and Jaden Reed get hurt, and now we're like, all right, well, we could use a little bit more depth at wide receiver. Josh Jacobs could get hurt. You could need a lot more depth at running back. You just don't know what that's going to look like. So you want to prepare yourself as best as possible. And the last thing I'll say with, uh, you know, regard to this is you don't, there's, this is an inexact science every single year. It would be one thing if like all the best players went in the first round and then all of like the really good players went in the second, the good players went in the third, the average players went in the fourth, the fringe players went in the fifth, the practice squad players went in the sixth, then the guys who end up cutting go in the seventh. If it just worked like that every single year and this was down to an exact science, all right, we can have a different conversation. You don't know where the good players are going to come from until you get them in the building, until they actually play some NFL football. You don't know how that's going to end up. So you might end up completely biffing a second or third round pick or a first round pick, but you might find a heck of a player in the sixth or seventh round or the fifth round. And Green Bay's had a great propensity to do that in the past. So more bites of the apple, not a a terrible thing. And guess what? If you have to release two players from the draft class, like they did last year with Grant DuBose and Lou Nichols, one there's a good chance you get one of those guys back to the practice squad like you did with Grant Dubose this past year. And Lou Nichols, you're not crying over a missed Lou Nichols pick when you have a draft that consists of Jaden Reed, Dontavian Wicks, Luke Musgrave, Tucker Kraft, Carrington Valentine, Lucas Van Ness, Carl Brooks, Colby Wooden, Sean Clifford. When you have that type of draft class, is anyone thinking of like, yeah, but they had to cut Lou Nichols? Who the heck cares? Go find as many good players as you can. Make the right decisions when you need to. If that means moving up and having less picks, that's fine. They have the flexibility to do that. If that means moving down and getting more picks, that's fine. They have the flexibility to do that. And I trust Goot to make the best decisions based on what his board says and being able to maneuver with the fact that he does have 11 picks. So 11 picks, sure. 12, 13, sure. 7, 8, 9, sure. Just make the right decisions, get the best players, and do what you need to do, and you have great flexibility to do so, and that should give Packers fans a lot of hope going into this draft. Then The last one I'll go over today, then, is I've seen a lot of people ask and, and talk about, of like, right, they have 11 picks. Goody needs to be aggressive. He needs to be aggressive and take that 25th pick, like we've seen done a ton of times, that pick traded a lot over the past 20 years. He needs to be aggressive and move that pick up and get the best player for Green Bay. Don't mess around. Don't just sit and wait. Go out and get a really great player. My question to you, and my question to myself, and my question to the Packers, and my question to the world right now is, who are you targeting? And what I want to do here is, is take the Packers draft history that we went over last week into consideration here too. We know that they love premium position players. We know that they love high athletic players, athletic freaks, if you will generally young players, like we know what they like. They have very much a type. That doesn't mean that they can't go outside of that. Doesn't mean that they haven't taken a linebacker or a safety. They have. Doesn't mean that they haven't drafted an older player, Devontae Wyatt, Demarius Randall. They have. Doesn't mean that they haven't taken a smaller school player. They have in Jordan Love. So they can always go outside of their comfort zone a little bit. But let's look at this draft board and try to pick out who are they trading up for? Who are they aggressively trading up for? And think of it, not with your mind for the player that you like, but think of it with Brian Gutekind's mind in mind. So let's look at it this way. All right. So if if they're going to trade up, you're looking at probably trading to pick 21 to pick what? 15, 16, somewhere in that range in all likelihood. And even that's probably aggressive. But like, who who is Green Bay targeting? Well, we know, first of all, it's not going to be a quarterback. They're not moving up with Jordan Love on the roster. 
We know that it's not going to be a running back. There's no running backs that are currently expected to be taken in the first round period, maybe even in the second round. So if they want the best running back, they could take it with probably their second, second round pick. They're not trading up for a running back. We can put it that way. I would also very much argue they are not trading up for a wide receiver. Not only are they not trading up, they're not drafting one in the first round. I would be beyond, beyond stunned if they did that. So wide receiver, not trading up for one. And like, if you're going to, tra- like, if they legitimately, like, they loved Adunze or Neighbors or Harrison, something like that, like, that's understandable. And, and maybe you consider taking that guy, right? They're just that freaking good. All right, but they're all going to be taken in the top 10 picks, top nine picks, probably, maybe even ahead of that. And as we just talked about, Green Bay's not mortgaging a ton of draft capital to go up and get in the top 10 of the draft to take a wide receiver when they have the wide receiver room that they do. And if you take someone like a Brian Thomas and a Donnie Mitchell, someone like that, I just don't think that that adds to your, like you have good wide receivers already. I think both of them are really good wide receivers, specifically Brian Thomas. I love Brian Thomas. I just don't think that that's the move to make. So I don't think they're moving up for a wide receiver. Like I said, I don't even think they're taking one in the first round, much less moving up for one. How about tight end? All right, so let's say Brock Bowers falls to 16. Could Green Bay make a move for Brock Bowers? No. Like, I'm just going to say it. No. You just spent a second and a third round pick on Luke Musgrave and Tucker Kraft, who both showed serious signs of being really good players. So no, you're not spending a first round pick and using another second or third, probably even you know, a high, like your high second to go up and get a tight end when you already have two on the roster. Also not something Green Bay does, not a premium position for them. So no, that's going to be out as well. So offensive tackle then becomes the next one. All right, so who are they going to move up to and take at offensive tackle? Alt is probably going to go very, very early in the draft. So are you going to move up for Fuaga, Fashanu, Fatanu, one of those guys? If that's a possibility, like they could feel that way, but here becomes the other conversation here. Are you going to use your pick 25 and additional draft capital to move up and go get an offensive tackle when, when you have Rashid Walker and Zach Tom as your starting offensive tackles right now? And what I mean by that is you probably are not drafting them to gain a tackle out of it. You have two starting tackles right now. Now, any of these guys, like let's say you can get Fashanu, for example, like he could go in and probably win the left tackle job. All right, now you have Rashid Walker on your bench. Is that the best use of resources? Probably not. I don't mind them taking a tackle at pick 25 or you know, moving down and taking a tackle. They need the depth. But to move up aggressively to go get a tackle when you have two starting tackles on your roster and might need to move Zach Tom inside in order to put your best five on the field, Again, I'm I'm okay with having those conversations at pick 25 or especially if you move down, but to aggressively move up for a tackle when you have potentially two starters on your roster at that position right now and a guy in Elton Jenkins who can kick out in case of emergency, I I don't know. I and, and the other thing you have to remember here too is this is a very deep offensive tackle class. Someone like an Amarius Mims, a Tyler Guyton, a Jordan Morgan, a Kingsley Sumatea all might be there at pick 25 or even maybe a, a Morgan or a Sumatia at uh, pick 41, where they can get somebody like that and still get a really good player. So I don't think that they need to move up. I think somebody probably is there at 25 or maybe even 41 without having to aggressively move up. All right, so how about interior offensive line? Somebody like a Graham Barton. Maybe, and maybe they view Barton as a tackle too. I wouldn't rule this out entirely, I think Barton very much could be the pick at 25, but you have to remember it's been since like, I don't know, forever since they've actually taken an interior offensive lineman early in the draft. It's just not something they do. So again, at pick 25, if he's the best player on their board, could they go in that direction? Sure. It's within the realm of possibility, especially somebody like Barton, who is uh, an incredible prospect and would easily be, I think, either an immediate starter at center, right guard, maybe even left tackle, basically whoever is your weakest link. If it's Rashid, all right, Barton fills in. If it's Myers, all right, Barton fills in. If it's uh, Sean Ryan, Barton fills in. I could see that, but I don't see them moving up for it. And Jackson Powers Johnson, same thing. I don't see them going pure center, not with a trade up. And again, he's probably just there at pick 25 anyway, if you want it to. Defensive line, Byron Murphy, Jazan uh, Newton, but neither of them really fit exactly what Green Bay likes to do from a size threshold standpoint. Could either of them get taken if they're at 25? Yes. 
especially someone like Byron Murphy. But I do not see Green Bay moving up using draft capital for either of those players. And you still have a pretty full room now. Kenny Clark, one year left on his deal right now. You could start looking at that. I wouldn't hate either of those picks, either Newton or Murphy, if they went in that direction. It doesn't scream out to me, especially in a trade up for Green Bay. So I don't necessarily see that either. Edge? All right, well, Dallas Turner's going likely top 10. Jared Verse could be somebody, but I don't, again, he probably goes in that 11 to 15 range. Do not expect Green Bay to trade up. And at edge, if you're going to trade up for an edge rusher, you have to remember Rashawn Gary, big contract. Lucas Van Ness, you just picked. You still have Preston Smith under contract. And Igbari comes back from injury. You have a flyer in, in um, you know, at, at the, the back end of the roster with Brenton Cox. I just don't see them going aggressive. And again, Jared Verse would maybe be that player. Chop Robinson doesn't hit their thresholds and probably is just there at 25. And Latu as the injury history. I don't see them trading up aggressively and he probably isn't just quite their type anyway. So I don't see edge rusher being it. Linebacker, Edrian Cooper, Peyton Wilson, if they want to take them, they in all likelihood are just there at pick 25. They're not moving up for either of those players. Safety, there's no safety that's going in the top 25. So there's no safety to move up for. Unless, unless, that brings us to corner. Corner slash maybe semi-safety in this case. All right, Terry and Arnold, I think probably just goes early enough where he's not in that conversation. I think that's probably the case for Quinion Mitchell as well. But to me, if you told me that Green Bay moved up, if you said they moved from 25 to 19, 20, 21, to me, it was probably for one of two players, Quinion Mitchell or Cooper DeJean. And Quinion Mitchell probably goes too early. And I don't necessarily know that Green Bay trades up for a smaller school player who is going to have to play on the outside and doesn't necessarily give them that versatility. And that really leaves you with Cooper DeJean. Now, here's the issue with Cooper DeJean. Green Bay loves premium position players. If they view him as an outside corner, I could easily see them potentially feeling like they could move up to go get him. And the fact that he has a ton of versatility doesn't hurt it either. But at outside corner, you do have Jair, you do have Stokes, you do have Valentine, you do have Valentine. You do have some options there. Now they need players. They can easily still go in that direction, but I'm not sure that they would be willing to trade up. And that would be if they viewed Dijon as a outside corner. If he's a slot guy, Green Bay has shown no propensity to put a significant type of you know investment in that spot. And the most significant investment they ever have put in that spot is the guy they just signed to a three-year $18 million deal in Keyshawn Nixon. And that brings us to safety. Now, they have drafted Darnell Savage around this spot. And, you know, it's not entirely impossible that they could view him as a safety and like him enough to pick him at that spot. But to trade up for him, I'm not so sure. And the other thing here, I don't necessarily view Cooper DeJean personally as a box safety, as that primary, you know, because we're expecting McKinney to play that post safety. I also don't view DeJean necessarily as a post safety. I view him as a too high safety. He's a great fit for a safety in, uh, you know, sort of that Joe Barry style system. I don't necessarily know that he has that full value in this style system with Jeff Halfley. So again, is if he's there at 25, could the versatility as an outside corner, slot corner, safety, punt returner all have value? Yes. But do I necessarily see Green Bay trading up for him? No. So that's where I sort of come down with everything. I don't see a logical, realistic trade-up target for Green Bay. And I think that's part of the issue too with like who even they take at 25 is you can make significant arguments about just about everyone as to why they shouldn't or why they might not take that player. Shouldn't is the wrong word, but why they might not or maybe couldn't take that player. It's a really tough draft to decipher. We'll continue to dig into it as we get closer and closer to the draft. But as we sit here today, as I look at who they would potentially move up for, man, maybe Dijon, maybe a Quinion Mitchell, but it's really, really tough to pin any sort of one player, any sort of one position that Green Bay would be willing to be aggressive. If you told me right now there was a trade, I would be willing to bet you a, not a significant, but a decent amount of money that it is a trade down and not a trade up based on this draft, based on Green Bay's needs, based on Green Bay's philosophies. It just doesn't seem like there's that perfect fit that they would aggressively move up for. 
All right, friends, that is going to do it for me today. Hope you enjoyed this episode, a little historical look at the draft and, of course, looking at some trade options as well. Looking forward to the rest of this month. It's going to be an absolute blast. Shout out to all of our Hall of Fame and All-Pro members, Most State of Minnesota and PJ Wynn, John Wilde, Shea Brad Dad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donna Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, and Dan Miller. Make sure to check out those Packaday Podcast YouTube memberships. They are awesome. You're going to get some additional Q&As, additional content. Like I said, day three of the draft is probably going to be members only. So now more than ever, a great time to sign up. Appreciate you guys a ton. I'll see you tomorrow, but until next time, and as always, go Paco.